Well, good morning, everyone. It is a privilege to be here. And, and what actually has been fun for me is I have seen so many faces that um, are familiar to me just from being in the Brook Network uh, over the years, um, all the Brook churches. And so this is a joy. Um, some of you may know me as the coffee lady. Uh, I uh, had opened, had the privilege of opening the coffee shop at Elmbrook uh, back in 2007. And you may go, well, how you go from coffee to pastor. Well, first, pastors like coffee. Um, and second, I just say, when you open your heart to God, he pulls out new things and new gifting that you never even knew was there. If you asked me five years ago if I'd be up here doing this, I would have said no. But here I am, and so it is my joy to be here. A um, little bit about me, uh, I am married to my husband Justin. We've been uh, together for 17 years. We have two kids. Uh, Jacob is 11, and Emma is 7, going on 17. So if anyone has any tips, I am certainly uh, taking them. Uh, but my son Jacob has a curiosity like none other, and he asks questions all the time that I think even the most brilliant of minds might like oh, have trouble answering. And so lately I just say, hey Alexa, <laughs> to which I get sometimes a good response and sometimes we just get a good laugh. Uh, but when he was about three or four, uh, he came to me and he said, Mom, I don't understand Jesus because I can't see him. And so I started to unpack who Jesus was and all this, and I, I realized that these were all abstract concepts that were not connecting with him by the look on his face. Like, what? And so I got the idea from a friend to use the fan to illustrate this. And so I said to him one day, I said, Jacob, do you see this fan right here? And he said, yes. And I said, let's turn it on. I turned it on. And I said, put your hand in front of it. So he puts his hand in front of it. And I said, now, do you feel it? He says, yeah, I feel it. I said, but do you see it? He says, no. I'm like, good, we're getting somewhere. And so then um, I said, and well, you see that the fan is a lot like Jesus, that we can feel him, but we can't see him. And I see that his wheels are turning, and he, uh, he turns to, to look at the fan, and he looks at me, and then finally, he breaks the silence, and he says, so you mean to tell me that Jesus lives in the fan? <laughs> yeah, not, not quite, buddy. We'll try this again later. But, you know, I can't help but wonder how many of us like Jacob, struggle to understand the mysteries of the Holy Spirit. Because his ways are mysterious. And you know, Jacob's curiosity leads him to ask a lot of questions that'll probably always be his nature. But here's the beautiful thing about curious questions, is they lead us to discovery. They lead us to challenge what we have always been certain of. You know, we're certain of the, the things that happen in our life, but what if there's a different lens to view it from? A different lens to view our current work situation, our current family situation, or, or even what we have always assumed to be true about God. And today we're going to meet um, a, a man whose curiosity led him to an encounter with Jesus. And he was certain of what he knew about God. This is the story of Nicodemus, which I am sure is familiar to many of you. It encompasses the verse John 3.16, for God so, let's hear it kids, that he gave his only son. Great job, you guys all passed the test. You know, but this, this verse, it's a fantastic verse that is packed with, with beautiful um, concepts for us to understand. But it becomes so familiar to us that I just wonder, doesn't it lose maybe sometimes? It's, it's, it's posted on like billboards and you see it at, at sporting events. Sometimes even football players like have that on their, their eyes. Why they even do that, I don't know. But, but it's a familiar verse that it's, it's packed with so much richness that I think sometimes we may lose the depth of it. 
And so today, I want to invite you into this story that may be familiar to you, to listen into this conversation with curious ears, and to ask the Spirit, what are you highlighting for me? Some of you may have walked with Jesus a long time, some of you may be newer believers, and some of you maybe are still seeking and questioning. But wherever you're at, there is something that the Spirit can highlight for you. So would you pray with me before we dive in deeper? Father, I just come before you. I thank you for this privilege to gather here as your church. And I just pray right now that you would give us attunement to your spirit, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see what it is that you want us to see from your words. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I really want to back up just to the last couple of verses in chapter 2 for just a moment, uh, because I, I, I I think there's some good pieces in here for us to see. Now, Jesus had been um, doing miracles. Now, the only one John has recorded up to this point is the wedding in Cana, but we know that it's during Passover time because verse 23 tells us he has been doing different miracles and signs and wonders. And so it says that the people believes in him. But then it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knows what is in the, the heart of man. And the people that were following him, they just wanted him for his signs. They just wanted him for a miracle, for some kind of comfort in life. And he knew what was in the heart of man. They saw him as a miracle man, not as the Savior God man that he really is. And I think it begs a question for us. How do we see Jesus do we see him as someone that just makes my life comfortable and gives me all the things that I want, the house, the family, the job, good health? Or do we see him as our savior? That no matter what happens in life, that we will say, I will follow you. When everything falls apart in my life, I will follow you. How do you see Jesus so directly following, you know, we have chapters and verses, right? Helps us organize the Bible. But back then when John wrote this, it was just one continuous letter. So I think it's an important thing for us to have in our minds that Jesus knew what was in Nicodemus's heart. Because right following those verses, Nicodemus shows up and he has a conversation with him. And Jesus knows what he's searching for. And we're going to unpack this story, and it's perplexing at times, but we're going to see that Jesus reveals to Nicodemus the way to enter the kingdom that he is bringing. So let's look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And at the first part of verse 2, it says, he came to Jesus at night. Now the Pharisees, um, just to give you a little of who they are, the Pharisees are like the religious elite. They are the ones who are upholding the law. And the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling, ruling council John is talking about, is like the supreme court of religious law. So Nicodemus was part of that. He was like the top dog. You know, he, he knew his law. He knew his Old Testament. And something about Jesus caught his eye. And I can't help but wonder if he too felt the same ache that we sometimes feel. That, hey, we're, we're doing all the right things, we're following what we're supposed to, but something's missing. And I couldn't help but wonder if that's why he came to Jesus. And so he comes to him at night. Now, why does he come to him at night? Well, we don't know for sure. He doesn't say specifically. Some people say it's because he didn't want his counterpart Pharisees to know. That he wanted this to be kind of secret. Some people will say, well, people were crowding around Jesus all the time. So this would have been the only time that they had any sort of uh, quiet time that he could really talk with him. But whatever the reason, um, he came to him at night. I also have to think that we need to remember who's writing this. So John, and in his gospel and also in his letters, he uses this theme of light and darkness all throughout. And it's interwoven. And so I can't help but think that there might be some intentionality of, of pointing out he comes to him at night to represent the spiritual darkness that Nicodemus was in even though he was devoutly 
religious. Which I think becomes a truth that becomes a mirror for the reader. So it's religious activity, following all the commandments, coming to church, reading the Bible, and prayer. They're all really good things, but they aren't what brings us into the light. Devout religious activity is not the same thing as following Jesus. And so, like Nicodemus, we need to get curious about the words that Jesus uses here to help understand that Jesus himself is the light, not devout religious activity. So this curious conversation leads Nicodemus first to be confronted. Let's read um, verse 2. This is Nicodemus as he comes to him, his words. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, I can't help but wonder if Nicodemus' original intent was to say respectfully, hey, Rabbi, we, you know, we, we see that you are clearly from God because no one could do all of these signs. But, you know, let me just kind of bring you into our fold and show you how we do things around here. Because at this point, Jesus has not conformed to any of their uh, religious or social norms. But regardless of what his original intent was, Jesus then flips the conversation. Let's look at verse 3. He says, very truly, listen up, just basically means listen up. I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are, oh, sorry, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So here Nicodemus comes to him about one thing, saying, hey, I see all these signs that you're doing. And Jesus is saying, hey, I see you. I see what's in your heart. And I need you to know that that's not the real reason why we're here right now. The real reason we're here right now is I'm going to reveal to you your real need. Because the signs, the miracles, that's not the real reason I am here. And so I wonder... Where do we need to be confronted by Jesus? Where do we need to be, ask ourselves, am, am I asking the wrong question? Am I saying, just Jesus, please take it away, whatever it may be? And maybe Jesus is just saying, I just want you to come to me. I just want your heart, rather than just you wanting a miracle from me. So Jesus flips it on Nicodemus to say, what I am really here is to share about a kingdom that is from above. Now Nicodemus would have known this kingdom of God to be like the future in the far off in the resurrection at the end of the age. But what Jesus is, is saying here, he's, he's shifting it a little bit and he's saying that I am bringing this new kingdom now, Jesus is trying to connect with language that Nicodemus may have understood, but he's also shifting it, and he's saying that I am coming from the future, because God is outside of time, and I am here to open hearts and to bring everyone who will listen to my message into the kingdom of God so that they may have eternal life. It is through Jesus that the order of heaven comes to the chaos of earth. And Jesus is confronting Nicodemus and saying, I want you to see this, that this is your greater need. You need to understand the true way to the kingdom. He's introducing a new paradigm, a shift that Nicodemus needs to say, this happens supernaturally, not just of the heritage that I am born from, being a Jewish man. I recently, or a couple years ago, learned how to wakeboard. Uh, and I grew up in a boating family, and we would ski and kneeboard and tube. And so when I had this opportunity, I thought, yeah, this should be easy. I'm comfortable behind a boat. And so uh, when you ski, you're facing forward. Your skis are coming out. And when you're, when you're wakeboarding, you're actually to the side, and you kind of have to churn your body. So I thought, well, I can use the same concept. I'm pretty sure it'll just happen. And so I get out there, 
get the wakeboard on, I'm holding on the rope, I start, I give the signal to go and feel the tension, and immediately it felt like a two-ton elephant was laying on top of me, and I did not have the strength to hold on, and I let go. And then I thought, oh, I can do this, I can do it again. So tried it again, same thing, tried it again, same thing and another, and I'm like, okay, I'm feeling a bit defeated now, but I was not going to let that stop me. So I got out of the boat and I turned to the professionals, turned to YouTube. <laughs> I figured there has to be someone who does a, a video on how to wakeboard. And so I watched this video and I realized that I was using the wrong method. I was trying to apply the principles that I would for skiing and for kneeboarding to this, and it wasn't working. And so I was confronted with new information that I had a choice. I can either go back out there and try what I've been doing, or I can try it differently. And so I got back out there, I applied the new uh, information, and I got up on the first try. Because it was, I just needed to shift it. I just needed to shift my thought process on it. And that's what Jesus is doing for Nicodemus here. He's confronting him and saying, you need to shift your thinking into understanding what the kingdom of God is and who the kingdom of God is on how one enters heaven. Which leaves our friend Nicodemus pretty confused. So Nicodemus is confused. Because let's look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, how can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Now Nicodemus is taking a structure that he has always known, right, like the reality of what's in front of you, and trying to apply that to Jesus' words, and, and it clearly leaves him with a goofy concept. I certainly can't get him back in my mama's tummy and be born again. That cannot happen. And I can't help but wonder if maybe a few of Jesus' disciples were around the corner listening in and going, what is this guy talking about? This is really goofy. But Nicodemus, I don't think he actually really thought you could do that, but it's as if his, his way of saying, Jesus, I have no idea what you're talking about because his reality was the natural or the external world and what you could see. And now as a religious teacher, he should have understood the spirit realm. Because as one pastor put it, we are spiritual beings with a physical experience. We're spiritual beings. It's not the other way around. And so there's something more that Jesus is wanting him to see here. Now here's the th beautiful thing about Jesus. Is that we can come to him with our confusion, with our questions, with our misunderstandings or our wrong ways of thinking, and he holds us safely in it. He sits with us patiently. You know, in a world where there's an expectation to have things perfect, to, to always be polished and that kind of thing, where you might get made fun of if you're not, or you could even lose your job, Jesus invites us just to come and to be as we are, and to ask our questions, to push ourselves in our thinking, but he holds us safely. You know, I've talked to a number of people who have struggled to take that step with Jesus because they don't understand it all. They haven't um, had all of their questions answered, and so they're like, how, how can I? But Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It starts with us just having faith in Jesus. And he takes that and he grows us and he shows us and he's patient. Because when we say yes to Jesus, we are not saying, yes, I understand everything there is to know. We are saying, no, I am going to be a follower of you. I'm going to open my heart. We encounter him through his word. We encounter him through prayer. And we are a lifelong learner. Because that's what a disciple is. And so we're showing up to God every day and saying, here I am, show me what you want me to see today. Give me new eyes. Now Nicodemus isn't getting it yet. So we read verse five. He says, Jesus answers, uh, very truly, listen up, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. 
Now, there's many ideas of what water and spirit mean here. Uh, a couple of the more popular ones is first that Jesus is talking about a natural birth, uh, our first being born out of when we're little, babies, and then a birth of the spirit. Now, this is probably not what Jesus means because the preposition of here connects water and uh, spirit. And so it's indicating that it's of water and spirit, which would mean one birth. And a second popular view that you may have heard of is, is that you have to be baptized, water baptized, and then you also have to be um, born of the Spirit. Now, there's a, a few problems with that, but one of the big ones is that this hasn't been an institution yet. It hasn't been a commandment to go and baptize. And so it, it's likely not that either. And further down in our passage that we'll see is, is Jesus reprimands Nicodemus and, um, for not knowing these things. So it's likely that Jesus is referring back to something that Nicodemus would have known and understood. And as a religious leader, he would have been very familiar with the Old Testament and would have memorized a good portion of it. So I want you to listen to the words in Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 27. This is where water and spirit come together and describe a beautiful new birth. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of I will move from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So we see the water that first cleanses us by the blood of Jesus that was going to happen when he uh, is, goes to the cross, and then we are supernaturally given a new heart by the Spirit. He's telling Nicodemus, you need a new life source. And I am here to fulfill that. He doesn't get away with the law. He fulfills the law. And Jesus is using language that Nicodemus should have understood. But he's not quite getting it. Now Jesus goes on, and let's read verses 6 to 8. It says, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus is trying to help Nicodemus to see that if you're still trying to fit who I am into your current political religious lens, it is not going to work. Because at this point, Nicodemus wouldn't have seen his need for Jesus because he's obeying all the laws. I mean, he's kind of in charge, right? He's the top dog. And um, not only that, but he's also born into the Jewish heritage. So in his mind, he's already got it. He's already in. But Jesus is saying, even with that heritage, even with all that schooling, it's not enough. You need a new heart. You must be born from above. You must be born again. And then we get to verse 8. And I can't help but wonder if in that moment just this gentle breeze may have blown by. And Jesus is like, this is the perfect opportunity for me to share. Because it's a, maybe a breeze that you could feel, maybe even hear the howling of the wind, but you can't see it. And so it is with the Spirit. It's a bit of a mystery a couple years ago, um, my aunt was in uh, hospice, and uh, it was a really hard time for our family. And so my sister and I decided we were going to go down and visit her. Uh, she lived in St. Louis, and um, you know we didn't get to see her that often. And, and we, we talked about faith, but not really in depth. And I was really feeling the burden that I needed to ask her directly, do you know Jesus? Do you know that you're going to heaven? And, and so before we left, um, I was just praying, and uh, there was a song that came on. It was around Christmas, and it was away in a manger. And there's a beautiful line in there that the Lord used to minister to me in this moment of prayer. And it was, it's, be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever. 
And as I listened to those words, I felt the Spirit just wrap his arms around me, and I felt grief and joy in tension with one another as tears came down my eyes. And then I felt this sense that I was supposed to take this song and play it for my aunt. And so we uh, left, we went down there, and we got to her room, and uh, she was frail, but she could communicate. And so we told her how much we loved her, and I asked her at one point, I said, Aunt Sherry, I said, do you know where you're going? Do you know that you're going to heaven? And she said, oh, I sure hope so. I hope I've been good enough. And I said, do you know that you can actually have the assurance right now because of what Jesus did through his death and his resurrection? And she, she didn't say much after that. And she began to get sleepy after a bit. And, and so I just felt like this is the opportunity to play the song. And so I said, can I just play this song for us? So I turned it on and it was a beautiful moment one that words don't adequately describe what happened. The spirit just fell in that room. And my sister and I, we both sensed his presence. And tears began streaming down our eyes as we knew that God was near us in that moment. And I turned to my aunt and her eyes were shut and I actually thought she was sleeping. But tears were streaming down her eyes. And it was a beautiful moment where I saw, felt, I didn't see him, but I felt the spirit move. I can't say for sure what happened in her heart, but I really felt that this was God assuring her that I am with you. I am with you. That's how it is with the spirit. We don't see with our natural eyes all the time. There are moments where we see that intersection of heaven and earth, but there's a lot of times where we just sense his presence. It's like the mysteriousness of the wind, and we feel his effects. It's something we cannot manufacture or predict, but the Spirit, he moves. He moves in ways and in our hearts, and many of you have felt that, and you understand that. Nicodemus, however, is still a little confused at his words. Because in verse 9, he says, how can this be? Just picture him giving this little look of like, huh? <laughs> Just like my son Jacob, huh? I don't get it. He isn't understanding the references to Ezekiel. He isn't understanding this being born from above or the mystery of the wind. I can't help but wonder how many of us resonate with Nicodemus. We say, God, I don't fully understand this. I still have a lot of questions. I mean, you came as a form of a man. You died on a cross. I, I don't get that. There's so much mystery. But what I will say to you is that questioning things leads us to push through a little bit further to discovery. And so if you have questions, that's okay. It's okay, and it's actually a good thing because it, it forces you to move outside of yourself and ask them, and I will tell you, Jesus holds them safely. Now in verse 10, we see that Jesus gives a gentle rebuke to Nicodemus to say, you're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things? Seems like they're both a little confused at each other's responses. So Nicodemus needs some clarity so let's look a little further. In verse 11, Jesus again is speaking, and he's clarifying. He says, very truly, listen up, I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake, in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus is telling Nicodemus once again that you need to recognize that you need a new life source. You need a new heart. And it's a heart that is not going to come from your religious Jewish 
heritage. It is a heart that is going to come to you through me by my spirit. And Jesus clarifies that he, as the Son of Man, will be lifted up and that everyone who looks on him will be saved. Just like the story in Numbers 21. Numbers 21 is a story um, that some of you might be familiar with. You can look it up later. But the Israelites were complaining to God. They were, they were just, why did you bring us out of Egypt into this wilderness and all we have to eat is manna? And they were just, and God was fed up with it. So he sent poisonous snakes. snakes and uh, they were many of them were either deathly sick or dying. And so they're crying out to Moses and Moses cries out to God, God, you need to do something. Please intervene. And so what he says is, is erect a bronze serpent and anyone who looks on the bronze serpent will be healed. And so what's happening here is that Jesus is saying that 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 was a foreshadow of what is to come. And I am the one that now is going to be erected. I am going to die on a cross and I am going to be the way through which you will receive eternal life, which you will receive this new heart. You need to look on Jesus to be healed, to have life. So when the source is yourself, your own teaching, your own status, your own making of your own kingdom, of accomplishment, it leads to death. But when the new, the new life, the new heart comes through seeing Jesus as your savior, not just a good teacher. And that happens through the mystery of the spirit revealing it to each and every one of us. So I have a question for us, for us all to ask. Is Jesus just a good teacher for you that does miracles, that provides for your daily needs? Or is he your savior? Is he the one that you will cling to and receive the new heart no matter what happens in this life? Now we don't see a response from Nicodemus. From his point of view, we're left with a little bit of a cliffhanger as to what happens to him. Now we do see him again later in the Gospel of John at the, at the burial with Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple. And I can't help but think that Nicodemus did make the decision to follow Jesus because at the burial, which is normally for servants or for women to do that job, here are two prominent men taking care of him and not only offering their time, but they're also offering their treasure. The, the amount that it would have cost for all those burial spices was a lot of money. And so I can't help but think that he probably did come to a faith in Jesus. Now the rest of this section, verses 16 to 21, I'll give you some homework to go read it later. Um, but John is restating in his own words what Jesus is saying here. And it can best be summarized with John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever will believe in him, who will ever look to him, they will have eternal life. They will have eternal healing. It's a simple truth that when taken seriously, not just simplistically, can change our whole world. And so for you this morning, what clarity do you need from Jesus? Where are you confused that you say, Jesus, I just need you to, to open my eyes to this because I'm not understanding and maybe for some of us, we need to be confronted gently by Jesus. And so as we close out, what I would like us to do is just take a moment in prayer. And so if you just close your eyes. And just take a deep cleansing breath. Sometimes breath can just be helpful to settle us in. And I want you to picture that it's just you and Jesus in this room. And I want you to share with him, Jesus, I'm confused on this area. I need clarity on this. He is our safe savior 
that we can bring everything to him. And then I just want you to listen. Sometimes our, our worlds and our lives are so busy that we don't take the time to listen. So just take a few moments. He may respond to you with a sensation. He may give you a word of scripture that you need to hold on to. He may show you something else. Just to tune your ear and listen. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, so that we may have eternal life with you. We confess that there are times that we are confused and we need clarity. But we trust you. And we trust that in the right time, you will show us and you will help us to discover as we follow you each and every day. I thank you for your powerful presence with us, that even though we don't see, we feel you and we sense you, just like the gentle breeze on a warm summer day. Thank you for your beauty. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.